Kylie Smith, thank you so much for joining us uh, today to, with Columbia Scuba's webinar series and, and talking to us about eye care. And uh, Mike Goldberg, thank you so much, the owner and operator of Key Dives. We, uh, we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Kylie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys so much for having me this evening. Um, first off, I just want to say I absolutely love what you guys are doing. Um, what a great way to get people involved in, in science and different different opportunities to dive in and really make a purpose or um, have a, a dive with a purpose. That's what you call it. And I think it's very aptly named. So um, as Lauren said, my name is Kylie Smith and I'm the co-founder of iCare. And uh, iCare is a new nonprofit based in Isla Mirada, Florida. And our goal is to involve recreational divers in coral restoration here in Isla Mirada. Um, in the later half of my talk, I'll focus a little bit more on eye care and what it is that we do. Um, as Lawrence mentioned, I did my graduate work at Clemson University, where I came down to the Florida Keys for the first time, and I focused my research on trying to understand how coral decline influenced reef fish behavior, um, specifically parrotfish, and looking at their foraging behavior as well as some of their territoriality. But a big part of what I did was looking at factors that influence coral transplants and trying to find the factors that we can account for to make coral transplants successful in the long term. And so I'll talk just a little bit about that tonight um, and kind of how I've been able to use that to create eye care and moving forward. So this work has been done here in the middle Florida Keys and we focused efforts here in Isla Mirada, because even in my short diving career, we've seen a big decline in coral cover. We've really moved away from these complex coral dominated ecosystems. And what you see on the right here is a typical reef here in the Florida Keys, or especially here in Isla Mirada and the rest of the Middle Keys. It's really flat. Most of the, the structure you see is actually coming from soft corals and not hard corals. And so I wanted to have a part in trying to reverse the shift and making it possible for these corals to be able to come back and thrive. And so before I talk about what we're doing here at iCare, I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. I know you guys have had a couple of different coral talks, but not sure who all has actually been present for those. Um, so as I was saying, I want to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page with a background and some basic knowledge about corals. So coral reefs are incredibly important ecosystems. They're considered biodiversity hotspots where they support 25% of all marine organisms, which is amazing given that they cover less than 1% of the ocean floor. Let's see. Whoop. Okay, sorry. Um, the corals themselves provide structural complexity that serve as nurseries for many of those, um, those organisms and their juvenile organisms. Um, they also provide protection for a lot of those organisms that inhabit the reefs from predators, um, as well as the corals provide direct food resources for a lot of those organisms. Coral reefs also help out us and human populations uh, by supporting our economies through tourism and fishing, especially here in the Florida Keys, as well as reefs provide land protection um, for shorelines against strong storms and other hurricanes. And so again, kind of taking a step back, a lot of people ask me, what is a coral? And you think it might be a really simple answer until somebody actually asks you, um, but it's kind of a loaded question. So there are a couple of different characteristics of a coral that actually makes up the, the entire animal. So corals are in fact an animal and they are made up of these tiny structures called polyps. And these polyps are typically a cup shape and it's covered in a soft tissue. And so here you see circled in blue, this is a coral polyp with its tentacles out and they use those tentacles to capture prey and then right above there, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse, right above there you can see some of the coral polyps um, with their tentacles pulled in. Corals are really not very good at catching their own food, uh, so they have a really important symbiotic relationship with algal cells called zooxanthellae, and I'll talk just a little bit more about those on the next slide. 
Typically what we see is a collection of coral polyps, which is known as a coral colony. And depending on the species, they can range in size anywhere from a couple of inches in diameter to absolutely gigantic um, six or seven feet across, depending on again, the species and how old that coral is. Corals are an animal, but they're also kind of a rock. Um, they secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton and it's the skeleton that can tell you a lot about the coral, um, specifically the shape of that cup or the shape of the polyp. And that's what we call the coralite. Um, some of them are more circular. Some can be raised. We call those outies. Some can be innies where the polyps are sunken in. And again, this all helps us with coral identification. And so corals may seem like a rock or a very simple animal, but they actually have a really complex life cycle. And so they start out as these individual coral polyps and they will start to undergo asexual reproduction. So they make tons and tons of copies of themselves until they reach the size that they're going to be the most optimal um, in terms of reproduction. Once they get large enough and old enough, they will start to undergo sexual reproduction where they release their gametes in these mass spawning or brooding events. In the water column, the eggs and the sperm will mix and they will fertilize the eggs. And that's whenever you start to get the development of the larvae. While it's in the water column and during this development, this is when something really important happens. This is when the corals uptake those tiny algal cells called zooxanthellae. And the corals have a symbiotic relationship with these tiny algal cells. The algal cells will photosynthesize and the byproduct, the waste is used by the coral for energy. And the coral lives in, or the, the algal cell lives inside that polyp. And so it gives, that structure gives the, the tiny algal cells the protection from other predators. Coral tissue is naturally transparent and so what you're seeing when you see a coral and it's all those vibrant colors is actually those algal cells inside the tissue. And so later on, I'll talk to you about coral bleaching, but what that is is the coral gets stressed and they expel those algal cells, leaving the, the coral clear. It's that clear um, coral tissue. So what you're seeing is actually the skeleton underneath that live tissue. So zooxanthellae is an incredibly important part of having a healthy coral. Like I said, corals are really bad at catching their own food. And so they actually, these tiny algal cells provide about 90% of the energy for a coral. So the, the larvae will spend about two to seven days in the water column, and then it picks up a cue from a reef. Um, these can be an, an odor cue or even a sound cue that tells the coral, this is a happy place for you to settle. And then it will undergo development into that individual polyp and start the process all over again. So I know that we're gonna do questions at the end, but I feel like this is a lot of information. Do I, so I do wanna take just a minute to see if anybody's got questions on any of kind of that scientific nitty gritty details about corals. I do, yeah. Kylie. The, 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 you say the larval settlement is two to seven days after fertilization. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's when it's gonna sink and attach itself to the limestone or the coral that's already there, some type of structure. Yeah. Um, and from there, is where it looks like the, the tree with the tentacles. How long does it take it to reach um, sexual maturity when it actually starts to, is there a time period that, that from when it it's attaches itself to when it can start reproducing again? Naturally, it can take anywhere from 40 to 50 years for a coral to reach, depending on the species. For a boulder coral, it can take several decades for it to get large enough to be sexually reproductive. So all during that time, then it's asexual reproduction. It's just spreading clones of itself. Yep. OK, cool. So Kylie, what you're saying is this whole cycle that you've drawn here on the screen, mm -hmm. you know, it, it looks like it would be pretty quick, but it really takes a long, long time. 
It does, yes. And and coral reproduction, the, the sexual reproduction, typically only happens once a year. Um, and it the, when it happens depends on where you are, but here in the Keys, it happens around the full moon at the end of August typically is when it happens. So only once a year, really slow growing, very long life cycled organisms. So, so Kylie, may I ask a question? And this may be leaping ahead. So we were there in February mm -hmm. and had the opportunity to, to, to help do out planning on some coral. And, and I assume at this point, they're starting to attach themselves to the limestone. How long will it take for those coral structures to start releasing polyps? Then is that decades? I'm gonna hold on to that for later on in the presentation because <laughs> okay. that's a Didn't big part ahead. of why we're so special and why Moat is so special. Okay, sorry. That's okay. It's a I great question. Like I want to ask a question not related to spawning, but still reproduction. That, so asexual reproduction, mm -hmm. after it gets fertilizes and lands in its happy spot, how long before that polyp will then start cloning itself for other polyps to start that colony growth? It's a good question, and I don't have a specific time for that, but there's a lot of evolutionary pressure for these corals to grow as big as they can to escape predation. So it's, it's going to be pretty quick. Again, it will depend on the coral species and the conditions, but I don't have an, an actual number on that. That's probably going to be one of the quickest part to really start development and start to clone itself to get to, to a size where it's no longer bite-sized. So let me ask one more question then. If you start with the asexual reproduction, okay, so you have one polyp, it duplicates itself. Now you have two and they duplicate, then you have four, then you have eight, 16. So is that an exponential growth of the size or is it only the first one that reproduces and the other ones kind of hang in there? That's also a great question. Um, typically your growth is gonna happen kind of around the edges as it's secreting its skeleton and it's gonna grow from the edges. So in a way it's exponential, but if you've got a center polyp, like maybe one of these guys here in the center, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse or not. Yes, we um, can. Cool. If you, these guys, once they've, once they have cloned themselves and they're no longer on the edge, they're not really in a good position unless they're building up. So some coral species kind of have these knobs. And so, you know, you can build up, but for the most part, you're going to get that cloning on the outskirts um, of the colony to try and increase its horizontal growth. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Any other questions? So on the, so like on a brain coral or something where it's really big, mm -hmm. They grow out a lot, or is that really, that was like a boulder or a rock and it just, some happened to land on that and, and spread and do their asexual reproduction on that? Something had to, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on because it, it, it's part of some of how we, out, how we transplant these corals, but something had to create, a coral at some point had to create that structure. Um, if you've got a brand new coral that has just settled on a reef and it's going to be secreting its own skeleton, it, it grows out and up, again, depending on the species of coral that it is. So something like a, a, a boulder brain coral, that's the really big brain coral. If you've got a brand new fragment, if it, if it has absolutely no structure, it will eventually create its own structure to get the size of what you see when you're diving. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Cool. I didn't know they could start from real tiny to, you know, to grow and out that big. That's cool. Corals are absolutely amazing. They seem like these really simple things, but they're, I think Ruth Gates said it really well in the Chasing Coral documentary that they have found a way to be really sophisticated in a very complex way, but not looking super complex. 
Any other questions before we keep going? All righty. So unfortunately, coral cover has been declining around the world since the 1970s. In the Indo-Pacific, we've seen a loss of about 5% each decade. And here in the Caribbean, it's been about a 20% loss. So we really are moving away from these coral dominated complex ecosystems towards these flattened ecosystems that are now being dominated by species of macroalgae. And so there's a lot of reasons for the decline in coral. Um, I've kind of picked out a couple of them that seem to be the most stressful. Corals are usually really good at dealing with one stressor, but unfortunately we've been throwing a lot of different stressors at them and that's whenever they really start to struggle. Um, so several of them are changing environments. Probably the biggest challenge for corals is the fluctuations in the seawater temperatures. So corals have an optimal range of water um, and any time that the waters move outside of that optimal range, most of the time it's whenever the water's getting hotter, but bleaching can occur whenever the temperatures are colder. If the temperatures are outside of that optimal range for too long, it can trigger the bleaching event. And so a couple slides ago, we talked about how those tiny algal cells, those zooxanthellae, live inside each of these polyps. What happens when the coral gets too stressed, the corals identify that as something that is foreign. It shouldn't be in their polyps and they expel it. Um, and so what you're seeing when you see a bleached coral is that white skeleton underneath the transparent uh, live tissue. The corals are able to, um, to reuptake those algal cells if the temperature comes back to their optimal range. Um, but like I said earlier, corals are really not that great at catching their own food. So they really rely on needing that new, that new um, uptake of those algal cells to survive. Another big one that we have here in the Keys um, is sedimentation. So dredging and um, strong storms can increase sedimentation. Again, those tiny algal cells are photosynthesizing, so they need sunlight and increased sedimentation or particulates in the water uh, can smother the corals and block out that sunlight, keeping them from photosynthesizing. Another one that we've had a history with down here in the Keys are decreases in water quality, specifically looking at high nutrient runoff. Here in Florida, agriculture is a huge, huge issue in terms of um, everybody's got a, a beautiful lawn and lots of landscaping, which unfortunately means a lot of runoff of those nutrients into the water column. Well, there's another type of algae that's in these ecosystems that are macroalgaes. And these algaes will um, use those nutrients in the water and will proliferate. And so as you see in this picture, you can get these fleshy algal species that will grow over top of corals, as well as cover up a lot of the space. So there's, there's no additional space for new corals to settle and to grow into their own colonies. Another challenge for corals is predation. Um, in the Indo-Pacific, they have the crown of thorn starfish. Luckily, we don't have that here, but these guys um, are super effective at eating an entire colony in a relatively short time. But here in Florida, we do have fireworms. I've seen a few of these while diving. You really want to be careful with these and not try to remove them. They do have these stinging cells, um, kind of these bristles that cover their body, and they're really not fun to touch. Of course, we have parrotfish. Parrotfish are mostly herbivorous where they eat that algae, uh, but there have been a lot of studies that show that these guys do snack on corals as, once they are transplanted. About the first two weeks is when we really start to see those parrotfish bites. It's almost like coral is back on the menu and they're really excited, so they're gonna munch it on down. Um, and depending on the, the severity of those bites and how much of the coral transplant is removed, can tell you a lot about whether or not that coral is going to survive that initial predation. Another common one that we have here are butterfly fish, specifically the four-eyed butterfly has that long nozzle that will kind of um, nip at those individual coral polyps. But the biggest predator we have here are the yellow-footed snails. These guys are native to Florida, but they're incredibly abundant. And as corals have been declining, 
it's really common to find them on corals. And when we start to remove them, you can get anywhere from 10 to 20 of these little snails on a coral head. And so they really can knock down the survival of your coral transplants. Another big one, just like in humans, that are naturally occurring are diseases. Um, corals, coral diseases tend to proliferate when the corals are stressed. Um, and I know that Josh Farmer talked a little bit about some of these coral diseases in your talk last month, so I won't go super into detail about this. Um, but for the most part, these diseases tend to be associated with a specific family or individual species. And they're usually associated with a discoloration. And a lot of these will move as a front across the coral. So some common ones that we have down here are white band disease, and black band disease, and then dark spot disease, which you can see on some of the bouldering corals. Another disease that we've had down here recently is the stony coral tissue loss disease. And this has been a really big problem for reefs here in Florida. Um, it started off of Fort Lauderdale in 2014, and it has very quickly been spreading throughout the Florida reef track and now the rest of the Caribbean. Um, it's it moves incredibly fast. Here's a photograph of a brain coral um, taken in early January, and then almost a month later, over 60% of that coral head is completely dead. Um, and there's been a lot of research to try and understand what this disease is, how it's spread, because it is really impacting a lot of our reef building corals. It's, in, it's um, about 23 of our 45 reef building species are susceptible to this disease. But not all hope is lost. Um, there have been a lot of great advancements in treatment. Um, and there's a, an awesome network called the CFAN network that really uses recreational divers and snorkelers to try to help them track the progress of um, their disease treatment. And so if you see these tags, you'll kind of take a step back and you'll see a larger coral head that maybe looks something like this. So here you have in this deep brown, you have the live healthy tissue. Up here, you've got dead tissue that's covered in a turf algae. And this kind of yellowy color is recently dead tissue. And so what scientists are able to do is they take an underwater grinder and they go in front of the disease line and they trench out an area that they put in an, a paste that has an antibiotic in it. And this essentially serves as a firewall so the disease won't cut over that antibiotic trench and it'll to try to help preserve any of that healthy tissue that is left. Um, they've had some really awesome success with this. And so if you take a photograph of the tag and then take a couple photographs of the coral, you can upload these to their, their website at cfan.net and be a part of their tracking of the treatment as well as the disease progression through different areas. And we do see these tags on a few of our sites, specifically Chica Rocks, which is right in the Key Dives in Isla Mirada backyard. So I mentioned earlier that I did my graduate work on um, coral transplants and trying to identify the factors that make these corals successful. And so I've kind of summarized some of what we, we found. First off, we found that species tend to respond to specific disturbances. So a branching coral like a staghorn coral might be more susceptible to storm damage while other corals like um, Orbicella fabulata, which is the mountainous star coral pictured up here in the top, might be much more susceptible to bleaching events. We also found that the local conditions can really impact the survival of a transplant. And when I say local conditions, I mean the half meter area directly around the coral. Specifically, we found that algae, that algal competition can really impact whether or not a coral is able to survive whatever disturbance it's exposed to. If a coral is putting all of their energy towards fighting off that competition from the algae, they're not able to have as much energy to fight, you know, the bleaching that's coming in or the disease that might be on their next door neighbor. And so this really led me to understand that it's the least local conditions that you really need to focus in on whenever you're transplanting corals. And so I wanted to use that knowledge as we move forward to, to really understand how can we help our transplants be more successful? What factors can we try to help control 
or um, maintain to help facilitate that growth. Throughout my experience with graduate school, I got to be a mentor and we worked with tons and tons of undergraduate researchers with other partners in the community. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that people want to help. Just like you guys are all here, people wanna dive with a purpose. People, if, if you give them a task underwater, they are addicted, they're hooked. Once you've take somebody on a cleanup dive, every dive becomes a cleanup dive. And so Lawrence talked earlier about Michael Goldberg and Michael Goldberg is the co-founder of iCare as well as the owner of Key Dives. And if you've ever been diving with them, conservation is their business model. They re recognize the fact that everybody is down here because of that coral reef. And without that reef, we're not going to have a future with our economy and raising our families down here. And so Mike has had such great success with, with keeping conservation at the core of his business and having divers that want to, to give back. And so we sat down one day and said, why can't we combine these ideas? Why can't we bring everyday recreational divers and let them transplant corals and be an active part in that restoration. And so iCare was born. And iCare stands for Isla Mirada Conservation and Restoration Education. And we are the first and only restoration organization to focus here in Isla Mirada. Why Isla Mirada? We have awesome diving here. Specifically, we have Alligator Reef. If you've never been to Alligator Reef, it's definitely on your bucket list where it should be. The fish life is amazing. You get in and there's hundreds and thousands of fish schooling. You see sharks all, all over the place, barracuda. It's a bad dive if you only saw five turtles. It's absolutely an amazing sight for the fish life. But the coral cover is really struggling. Um, this was one of the coral heads on Alligator Reef in 2015. And this is that same coral head just four years later in 2019. And so not only is the coral cover declining in, this, in these areas, but we realize that people are getting in the water and not realizing what they're seeing. Um, they get in the water and they, they don't realize that this is a dead coral head, that they don't know what a, a healthy coral reef is supposed to look like. And so it's, it's kind of a long story about what the E in eye care stands for, but it stands for education because that's a big part of what we want to do. We want to educate everybody, divers and non-divers, the importance of coral reefs and what a healthy coral is supposed to look like. There are a lot of different organizations that are down here working on um, coral restoration, but one I want to talk specifically about is Moat Marine Laboratory. Moat is officially our partners. They're who we get all of our corals through. And so I wanna talk a little bit about some of the science that's behind the corals that we get and kind of some of their, um, their protocols or their methods that we have adopted here at iCare to transplant corals. So Moat gets all of their corals, they go out to the reef and they, have co they collect a coral that has survived the last decade which just in the last decade, that means that they have been exposed to two uh, consecutive bleaching events, to Hurricane Irma, the stony coral tissue loss disease, the cold snap of 2010, everything that we could potentially throw at them. And they bring this coral into the lab and they run it through a tile saw and fragment it to pieces about the size of your fingernail. They then attach the, um, they just super glue the corals to these ceramic pucks and they put them in the nurseries to grow. And they, because you're cutting the edges, it's very similar to that cloning process. You're triggering a growth response. So you get faster growth when these corals are smaller and have those freshly cut sides because they want to heal and grow to escape bite sides. Once the corals have fully healed and they've grown over the majority of this little ceramic puck, they undergo these treatments where they ramp the temperature up and they drop the pH of the water to conditions that they predict will be on the reef 10, 20 years from now. And it's only the corals that survive these conditions that will be outplanted onto the reef. So they're really essentially giving these corals a cold before they put them out in the wild where they're exposed to everything else. 
they also do um, something that we call assisted reproduction. So they have this awesome, it looks like a photo booth where they've been able to mimic the conditions of coral spawning season where um, year round. So these corals will be able to spawn multiple times and they're able to take maybe the sperm from a coral that survived um, high temperatures and the eggs of a coral that survived the stony coral tissue loss disease and they'll mix those together to create a new genotype is what we call it um, but a different strain of this coral that might be able to survive both of those conditions. So they're doing some really awesome science down there to make sure that what we're transplanting will survive once we've put it out. In terms of how we transplant these corals, we take advantage of those old dead coral heads using a method called reskinning. So we know that a coral needs the structure to survive. So what they do is we take these old coral heads, we go out and we scrub all the algae off of it, and we um, use an underwater epoxy, which kind of like a super glue, and we attach these corals to that coral head. Then as these guys start to grow, they will grow over that skeleton. And all of these corals came from the same parent colony. So what happens is that as that coral grows, it butts up against each other, recognizes it came from the, it's the same colony, and it will fuse to create a larger colony. And they're able to get these corals in about five years, what naturally will take 50 to 75 years. If a coral had to go from that individual polyp stage and create its own skeleton and be able to survive on its own. So this in itself is absolutely amazing. We're able to put coral out on the reef that's able to contribute to the populations there that are, you know, that's providing food resources. It's providing that structure. But what's even cooler is last August during spawning season for the first time, a, a coral that was transplanted using this reskinning method spawned in the wild. This coral was only five years old. Remember earlier I mentioned that it can take 40 to 50 years for a coral to grow to this size to where it can reproduce on its own. And they did it in just five years. So not only are these corals helping out the, the contributing to the current coral cover, but they're also able to help sustain their own populations and be able to increase um, the populations of the future. And so that's the methodology that we use for the boulder corals. We also have been working a lot with staghorn coral, which is the branching species. The way that they work on this is very similar in theory. I go out to a wild population and take a clipping of it. They hang it in the nursery in these tree-like structures. This species is actually a lot faster growing and so they can double their size in about six to eight months. And so we go out and collect these corals from the nursery and we outplant them onto the reef using a masonry nail. You hammer into the bottom and you cable tie the fragment to that nail. We do these in close clusters of five. And again, these guys all came from the same parent colony. So as they grow, they're gonna fuse into one larger colony, which will increase their survival. So here is a picture of a reef down in Summerlin Key, which is off of, um, which is close to Key West. And you can see there's about nine of these clusters of corals in the foreground and the background. There's one here and here and here. This is taken on outplant day. This is one year later. And just two years later. So they're really able to take these reefs that have virtually no coral cover. They're really flat and they're making these beautiful, healthy thickets of coral that will, the next storm that comes, it'll break off some of these corals, they'll roll away and start new colonies. For this coral species, they told me that um, after being in the, after being transplanted for just two years, they will start to spawn on their own. And so that's kind of, what, what Moat has been doing. And so here at iCare, we've been, we've been using the science that Moat does and a lot of their methodologies to transplant these corals. And so like I said earlier, we're the first restoration group to focus their efforts here in Isla Mirada. So iCare, what exactly are we going to be doing? What are we doing with dive shops when they come down? 
and what makes us different. So we are the first organization to partner with local dive shops. We've got three dive shops that we work with and we train their customers to transplant um, these corals. And so what happens is you come down in the morning of your dives, you meet at the Bud and Mary's Marina and we train you in everything you need to know. We'll, we'll teach the customers how, um, how, why coral reefs are so important, how to um, actually transplant the corals. We have a hands-on demonstration and you get to ask us any questions that you have. And then in the afternoon, you go out and you do a two tank dive where you get to transplant corals and help us maintain some of the previously transplanted corals. And this is a great way to create stewards for these environments because you're allowing them to be an active part of the restoration. Some of those maintenance activities include the removal of that competitive fleshy algae away from our corals, as well as the removal of these coral eating snails that I mentioned before. Something else that sets eye care apart is we monitor the entire reef community. So we do surveys of the mobile invertebrate community. So we look at um, the, the crab species and the urchins, which are really important herbivores and the spiny lobsters. So we can try to understand how large scale restoration influences their populations. We also take a look at the rest of the organisms that are growing on the reef bottom. So we're looking at the abundance and diversity of soft corals, of sponges, of natural corals. We're looking at recruitment of new corals to see how, again, nobody's really ever addressed the question of how restoration influences the entire community. We have some awesome partnerships. I've talked a lot about Moat Marine Laboratory. Not only do they provide us with our corals, but they have installed the first ever land-based nursery here in Isla Morada. Um, it should be up and running, hopefully by the end of June is what we've been told, but already it's incorporated into that training session. So when people come and they learn about the corals, they get a tour of the nursery and we'll be able to see the corals right there in that land-based nursery. And we're gonna be able to develop some continuing education courses where divers and non-divers can come to the land-based nursery, help clean tanks, because that's always a big part of what we're doing, um, but also to maybe help fragment those corals and during spawning time, help collect the, the sperm and the eggs so we can do some of that assisted reproduction. We also have a partnership with Reef, um, who monitors the, the reef fish abundances and diversity on these sites. Again, so we can try to have a better understanding of how the restoration influences those different populations. We're also collaborating with several different universities. This summer um, coming up, I believe the first Wednesday in June will be our first ever uh, sponge transplant dive. So we're working with a lab out of Florida State that looks at the importance of sponge diversity and being able to um, identify those sponges and go out and transplant those sponges on our reef. I've been learning a lot about sponges and some of the symbiotic relationships that they have with corals. Specifically, the sponges will help stabilize structure to allow for more areas for coral restoration. We also are working with a couple of labs from Florida International University, Josh Farmer, who gave the talk last month, I'm trying to work with them on looking at the effects of temperature changes on our coral transplant success, and of course, I still have the association with Clemson University and my lab. Um, specifically, there's a student there who's doing, um, looking at communities associated with marine debris. So they're gonna be here this summer and they may be jumping on the boat during your cleanup dives and sorting through all that trash and, and taking a look at how um, the debris influences those little tiny critters. So iCare has opened up the doors to all of these awesome collaborations and we're always open for more. And so where are we? We started transplanting our corals in January, 2021. So we've been up and running for just a few months. For the most part, we've been focusing on our staghorn and elkhorn corals, uh, but we're hoping this summer to be able to start moving a lot more into those bolder corals. Um, just about two weeks ago, we hit 1000 corals transplanted across all of our sites. And our survivorship is really high. We've got about 98% survival so far. And so 
Here on the top, we have a picture of some staghorn coral that we transplanted. This is on outplant day, and this is about a month later. And so you can see if you look closely, these corals will grow over that cable tie in, in no time. This is all new tissue growth. And some of these corals have even started to fuse and create these larger colonies. So it's been really exciting to watch all of this come together. So how can you guys get involved? Well, it's easy for you because you're divers. So you guys will be able to come down and I believe uh, Columbia Scuba has got um, a trip scheduled in June. And you can book a dive with one of our partnering dive shops. Our shops are Key Dives, Isla Mirada Dive Center, and Conquer Public Divers. So we run um, five trips every month, and our schedule is on our website. Um, we're also really open to booking conservation dives with some of our partners. So you can come down, and if you want one day to be transplanting with eye care, we can do another dive with Reef where you can go out and call lionfish, and then maybe pair it or in the weekend with um, a cleanup dive. We also have partnered with a local snorkel operator at Chico Lodge to offer an eco discovery tour every Sunday. Some of our interns jump on the boat and they teach snorkelers all about coral ecology, um, get jump in the water with them and work on um, identification of whatever it is that they see. Follow us on social media for any updates. We're on both Facebook and Instagram at I Care About Coral. If you've got anybody that are not divers that want to get involved, we're very happy to take donations um, or any other suggestions of how we can get um, some of those other diver, non-divers involved in some of these activities, especially when the land-based nursery gets up and running. We are very much a community effort. We are doing the work to benefit the reef community. We are, the work is actually being done by the community, but we're funded by the community. These are just some of the businesses that have contributed, and they range from dive and snorkel shops, fishing charters, um, restaurants, hotels, and marinas. We have um, a spear gun company. We've got um, construction companies. We've got a tattoo artist. I can, we cannot thank them enough for all of the support that they have given us up to this point. The way that these businesses have helped, some people have gotten really creative. When you jump on one of the dive boats, um, you get a $2 donation that goes to every diver on a boat. Some shops are even donating 2% of all of their revenue. Hotels in the area are donating anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar a night. Some are asking their customers to match that donation. Businesses have donation boxes all across, across town where you can um, buy one of our stickers for a donation. And a lot of them have these awesome, I care about our ocean shirts, which I am wearing tonight, though I'm short, you can't see it. Um, but you can buy those at all of the dive shops as well as a lot of the stores around town. And so we're really excited to have you guys come down. Um, we're really thrilled to finally be up and running and have a way for divers to be able to get involved with coral restoration. And um, here's our contact information. Uh, my email or both both Mike and I's email, my number as well as Mike's number, and we'll be happy to take any questions. Hey Kylie, it's Tim. I've got one. Okay. Um, you mentioned about the sponge out planting that's happening and looking to the concern about al algae overgrowth. They're recently starting to put long spine sea urchins back out. The um, aquarium has done that in partner with Frost Science Center. Is there a way that you guys can request things like that? That would be contributors, or is that something that really you don't have a say in the matter? It's the, I'm gonna say sponsoring institution that that is determining where those would go. It is, so it, it's, we, we've actually had a preliminary conversation with one of the guys at Frost. Um, and it's something that we are really excited about trying to do. Um, I know you have to have an FWC permit, but I don't know if there are any restrictions in terms of where you can do this. I've got one site in mind that I think would be really cool to do it. Um, it's a site that we just got our permit today, actually, to start out planning there. It's a pretty isolated reef. Um, I'm thinking we need to build a little bit of the structure though, because we want to make sure that whenever we're putting the urchins down, they don't leave. 
We want to try to have, you know, food sources there for them in a, in a happy area for them to hide from predators. So it is something that we are trying to do moving forward. I just don't have a whole lot of great updates on that. Kylie, one question I have, and, and we can obviously we can talk about this offline with with you and Mike later. But but what's the um, we we have a number of schools that we work with, and and they are very interested in coral. And and I, I'll I'll talk to you guys I guess in June. Uh, is is do y'all have any or does Moat have any or is or do you know of anyone? that works with educational institutions to house coral at the school? Um, so I know a lot of agencies, you have to be a certified facility to house corals that are taken from, collected from the wild. So in, in light of the stony coral tissue loss disease, there's been a big coral rescue effort where FWC has gone in front of the disease line to try to collect as many corals as they can. And zoos and aquariums across the country have stepped it up to offer facilities to house those corals. So they, but they do have to meet pretty specific guidelines in order to have live corals. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I think that, that Moat would be excited. There's, um, you know, with, the, with this new nursery in terms of bringing school groups down, but in terms of sending live coral back up, I'm not sure the permitting there is kind of where it would be a sticky situation. Sure. Just, just, just a thought, and we will be bringing school groups to you. Awesome. Any other questions? Holly, I teach school, so I know how weird it is to talk to a bunch of like names and <laughs> black backgrounds. But I was really excited to see how much the corals were growing that y'all had planted earlier. So um, that's just exciting. So, and I would love to, um, will you leave Lawrence a copy of your presentation? Because some of the statistics in there were pretty neat and we need some stuff to do after the AP exam. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I know I shared a copy of it with Tim. Tim, feel free to, to share that with anybody. Um, absolutely. And if there's anything else that I can help with, answer questions or whatever, um, not only myself, but my interns have gotten really involved in, you know, having question and answer sessions with some of the younger age groups. So any way we can help educate, please feel free to reach out. Super. That's great. Let, let me ask. Um... maybe a more difficult question. So you said you've now planted a thousand corals, mm -hmm. which is really cool and, and they do grow really fast. Um, what sort of an area can you cover? In other words, you know, Florida's got, is a big state <laughs> with lots of coastline and lots of reefs. Um, what will it take, let's say over 10 years to cover an appreciable area Let's just say around Isla Morada, which, by the way, we've been to and have to dive, and it's very nice. Um, <laughs> in other words, it, it, if you look at the lionfish, right, trying to control lionfish by going out and, and collecting lionfish, there's so many that's really tricky. Um, how much in the long run, I mean, these things are growing really fast. So obviously, once you've established an area, you know, you can move on to another one. Um, do you have any sense for the sort of timing on something like this? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, we, we are the very first group to do this. There are a lot of eyes that are on us. Up to this point, it's been mostly scientific agencies that have been doing the coral transplanting work. Um, and a lot of people are really excited about this to see if we can use this as a model in other areas. Um, to people have been very hesitant to just give up that that control of working with corals because they're already so fragile, they're already so endangered. Um, I don't have a I don't have a solid timeline on it. I can tell you that 
you know, we, we've hit a thousand corals, but a lot of our trips have been canceled due to weather. We're able to average anywhere from 50 to 100 corals being outplanted in just one trip, um, depending on the size of the boat and how many people come. At Alligator Reef, we have already probably doubled the amount of coral cover that was on that reef before, just with the efforts that we've been doing. Um, and especially with something like the staghorn coral that's really fast growing and you, you just like those pictures that Moat saw, you, you see an effect. Um, but but the, the cool thing about doing this the way that we do it with Moat is because you're out planting in these clusters, you've got your cluster of five, but you wanna out plant several clusters, all of the same genotype. So as they grow, they start to fuse even more. But whenever you're done and you kind of take a step back, you can actually see the work that you've done. And that is a really rewarding experience. So I, I, I don't mean to dance around your point. I don't have, because, because this has never really been done before, I don't have a great answer for that question. But so far, we've been able to see a difference in the area that we're working. I mean, I really like the fact that you are sort of selecting really survival traits in, in the corals, right? You're picking the ones that have the best chance to make it. And so what you're planting, you know, we certainly hope will, you know, not get bleached out next a year from now or so. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm very hopeful. I think this is, it's a good scientific approach, which I, which I like. Um, Absolutely. It's a big part of, of why we're doing what we're doing is we want to keep science at the core, but we also want to make sure that, you know, the, the, the time is here for to get the hands out there and to really start getting the work done. And, and a big part of this is to monitor these corals, try to figure out who's not surviving where, so we can try to better understand how can we make this better moving forward. Um, but also getting people involved in doing some of that, that, um, that maintenance, removing the snail predators, removing that competitive algae in a way, you know, to where we can try to get herbivores able to kind of catch up um, and really give these guys the, the best success that we can. And that's where you guys come in is just to help us do that. Ailey, I have a, I'm, I'm sorry, Hanno, if you've got another question. Oh, I'll no, I'm Okay, Kylie, you, you mentioned earlier that that you had a 98% survival rate for, for the coral that's been outplanted so far, which is fabulous. It's tremendous. Um, if you can, can you share what you thought was an acceptable survival rate to compared to where you are? And is some of the lack of survival due to predation or is it something else? We, so I guess I have to be kind of careful with that, that number because it's, we've only really been working with one species and that has been the staghorn. Um, mostly because Moat has a lot of it to, give, to, to try to get out there. Um, but it's, it's really user-friendly to work with. The, the, the staghorn undergoes intense predation by the snails, typically around five to six months once it's been outplanted. So we're really getting into the point now where we're gonna really start wanting to do some of that snail removal and being vigilant and going around and making sure that we're picking those guys off. The other coral species, which we've got about a hundred of them out that are on the pucks, those are the ones that the parrotfish start to munch on as soon as they get transplanted. Mm. And they look awful. Oh my gosh, the first, the first month after we outplanted those, those elkhorn corals, both Mike and I were just swimming around like, oh my gosh, they're not going to survive. They, they look horrible. And we went out, neither one of us had been out to alligator in a couple of months. And we went out last week and we were high-fiving each other under the water. They've got their color back. They're starting to fuse. They look awesome. They're starting to get their little branches to, to come up. Um, in terms of what we've seen in terms of that mortality, I think a lot of it has to do with what are called ciliates, which are a, a little um, inver micro invertebrate that have to, they kind of live down in that turf. And it's just whether or not it's this area versus that area, and they just start to pick on that coral 
um, as, as they move. So I, I think that's for the most part what we've seen. Some genotypes don't do as well in, in deeper sites. One of our sites, Victory, um, we chose it because we can work there year round, but it's definitely on the limit of the deeper, the deepest range of the staghorn coral. Um, again, it's, it's been a lot of tracking and trying to figure out what works where and, and what doesn't so we can use that moving forward. Any other questions? Or Mike, did I miss anything? Ironically, I just got a text from Lad Akins during the call, uh, during your presentation. Lad is the person who is behind the sea urchins with uh, Florida Aquarium. And uh, he's, uh, um, he's at Frost. And uh, he was just saying it, it was a lot more successful than he anticipated. He was very surprised. So that's hopeful. Awesome. Uh, I, I reached out to him uh, earlier in the day. So it's funny he just responded. Hi, Lee. Anyway. I do have one question for you. What happens to the corals that are not selected for transplant because they don't survive as well in the laboratory conditions? So, what happens to those? Um, a lot of them will be will be used for you know tissue analysis or um, you know trying to to do a little bit more of that that gen try to get a, a better understanding on a genetic level of why they didn't survive. Um, it's it, we, these guys are so small that it doesn't take long to kill them. So pretty much every organization has a a boneyard for lack of a better term. And again, we, we try to use those as best we can whenever you come and do the demonstration. You're actually using coral skeletons. You're using the real thing. Of course, they're not alive, but um, so we're at least able to use them for, for educational purposes. Okay. I wondered. It's a great question. Has the genome of the corals been determined? And do you genotype them to see, you know, how they're related to one another, you know, how many generations down they've gone, and maybe even see, you know, which specific um, genes they have that may give them a survival edge. I know that Moat has done that. That's, that's definitely more on their side of things, um, especially whenever things get really complicated, like how they're going to respond to a disease. Um, because it, and, and more and more research being done right now that it may not necessarily be the actual coral genetics, but it could be a combination of the coral genetics, the zooxanthellae genetics, as well as the microbiome of the coral. It's so incredibly complicated and I'm much more on the ecological side of things than I am on the micro side of things. Um, I know that Moat has tracked what genotype they've mixed with what to create. The, those new genotypes. Um, and so they, they give us that data that we're able to analyze as we're looking at survivorship so we can try to understand, okay, we can go back to them and say, this genotype did not do well at this site. We think this is kind of what's going on. In terms of the sequencing the genome, I don't know. That's a really good question and I don't know the answer to it. Okay. And, and along those lines, you know, maybe you could develop a vaccine um, <laughs> for some of the diseases and just gotta get very small syringes to get them all shots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a big effort because they have not been able to identify the pathogen yet that has caused stony coral tissue loss. And so up here where, you know, we, it, they call it the endemic zone where the, the disease has already come through, we don't really know yet have we stopped seeing the major outbreaks because it's no longer here? Or has it just already burned through all of the corals that were going to be susceptible to it? And so there's actually a big project that just started about two weeks ago that's multi-partner, multi-agency throughout the Florida Keys Reef Tract. Um, 6,000 corals were just transplanted that all are coming from these susceptible species in the endemic zone to where the, the restoration practitioners 
can try to address the question, is it safe to outplant these bouldering corals in mass yet? And that's a big reason why we've been working with the staghorn coral more so than the bouldering corals. Any other questions? You guys have great questions. I expect just as many questions when you come down for the training so you can ask my interns because they, they need the practice. Keyword, you want the interns to have all the hard ones. So yeah, Kylie, yeah. thanks. Um, and before we sh close, any last, any last minute questions? Because there's one other thing I want to do before we, we shut down. So any last questions for Kylie? Okay, so wanna give Karen a, a chance to talk about the upcoming webinar because it's the topic feeds into something that, that Kylie said on, on how that data can be used to help them. So Karen, talk, talk to us about what's gonna show, show up on our webinar series June 1st. So hi, I'm Karen, for those of you who um, I have not met yet. And I just wanted to say that I pulled out my reef coral book and studying. I love all the reef books. I own them all. <laughs> um, so I am our resident fish lover and love to teach all about fish and identification. And so just like you guys, Kylie, have partnered with Reef. Our shop has also partnered with Reef. And we are planning to do... Um, citizen science that way by um, doing fish surveys. So um, when we do surveys, um, they have a course and when you join Reef, you become a level one member. Once you've submitted two surveys and passed their little test, then you can be a level two and you can work your way on up. So um, we're looking at doing lots of surveys, so the coral surveys, and then also taking the time to do fish surveys and submit the data so that reef is also seeing um, the health of the reef from that perspective. So I'm really looking forward to doing that because that's really my passion in diving. And hopefully let us know that it doesn't take a whole dive to do a fish survey. You can it get it does done and not. still enjoy it. Although, you know, it's a little bit different than the coral surveys where um, they want you to identify every fish you can. So that doesn't mean you have to spend your whole hour identifying fish, but they do. Um, if you are sure about the identification, they want to know what you saw. So... That's what you're Thanks. going to be talking about on June That's 1st. That's what I'm going to be talking about on June 1st. And the links on the website, there'll be some reminders coming out on the Instagram and Facebook accounts for Columbia Scuba if you want to keep an eye out for that, but it'd be Tuesday, June the 1st. Lawrence, anything else to let you close? Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, Kylie, I can't thank you enough. And, and Mike as well, I really appreciate you both being here. And, and we're really looking forward to seeing you guys. We're, we're, we're going to be doing dives with you for, for out planning on the 5th and the 12th, I believe. And um, we have a lot of people that are coming that are very enthusiastic about the opportunity to learn about what you're doing and to help. Because you're giving people an opportunity to get hands on in making a difference. And I think that's so cool. Um, so really, again, appreciate your time tonight. Uh, just for anybody's, if, if anybody's interested, we, we still have a couple of spots left that have opened up. And uh, we, uh, we look forward to being down there June 4th through the 14th. And so we, we appreciate you so much being here tonight. Mike, look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, Kylie, you're amazing. And, and Mike, you are too. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you much guys. for being here tonight. Thank you guys for all the support and allowing us to talk about it. We can't wait to see you guys in June. Looking forward to seeing you guys.